Psalm 119, uh, if you look at me very quickly, I'm not going to read the entire psalm. Uh, psalm 119. Uh, we'll, be, we'll pick up our reading from verse 97. Let us stand for the reading of God's word on this Lord's Day morning. Psalm 119, we pick up from verse 97. Here is the reading of God's word for the sermon on the Lord's Day morning. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, uh, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. And I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey to the mouth. Your precepts I, in, uh, from your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and light unto my path. This is the reading of God's word for the sermon. Shalom. Amen. Amen. My sermon is a bit unusual this morning, because... I will fill most of it with addressing social issues and then what is our response to these issues as Christians. So the title of my sermon is very simply, The Christian Response. The Christian Response. And I thought to bring you this sermon today and I hope it will be of encouragement to you. But not only of encouragement but also directional to you but especially directional to parents this morning that are listening to the sermon. And why do I say especially important to parents? Because, well, because parents have the responsibility and the duty to raise the children in the way they should go. And that not, not only involves you getting your children ready for school, uh, but involves you, involves you directing them in the way they think, in the way they consider matters, in the way they pray, in the way they consider various things. And so it is your responsibility as parents today. So I do address you, parents today. But nevertheless, we also address young people today that are sitting here listening to the sermon. So let's launch straight in. In the midst of so many issues being covered on the news and on social media, how your children respond to those issues depends very much on what you teach and direct them as parents. Consider some of the issues presently facing your children or, or the issues that your children are engaging with either on social media, with their friends at school personally, through universities, through social groups, through one form or another. Consider some of the things they're facing. Well, the Meghan Markle issue with the Oprah Winfrey interview, one issue. Consider then the other issue, the school uniform issue, uh, where it was reported that uh, uh, the change of uniform is regarded as racism. Consider the government report that came out a few weeks ago uh, that says that racism is no longer an issue in our nation. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And I'm trying, I will try not to address every issue. We will be here all day or even more if we do that. But I hope, I hope by the end of the sermon you will say, I have a principle here by which I have to respond to all matters that I face on a daily basis. And I'm able to teach my children how to respond to these issues. Our response to these matters raised here today and the matters raised in the world come down to worldviews. And we're familiar with that word, worldviews. We, we, we are very familiar with it. People respond from their worldview. Now many don't even know that they're responding from a worldview. When you say, what is your worldview? They may say, what is that? But actually, in essence, whatever they say, how they respond, whatever they comment, whatever their opinion is, whatever their view is, they're speaking from their worldview. When a person makes a comment or gives an opinion about an issue, they're speaking from their worldview. A worldview is very simply a lens through which you see the world. A lens through which you see the world. For example, an atheist views the world very differently from a Christian. An atheist who sees the world as a cosmic accident uh, with a non-existent God and his response to life's questions and challenges already come from that worldview. That really we are, we're just here by random chance and coincidence. We really have no accountability really to each other because we're merely animals. 
evolved animals, as Plato said. Political animals, sorry, as Plato said. The Christian sees the world as created by God and, and, and mankind being the imago dei, the creation of God. And that mankind is accountable to God to worship him because the uh, question one of the Westminster Catechism says, what is man's primary purpose? And the answer given to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So every day of our life to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is our responsibility, our accountability before the Lord our God. So it's a matter of different worldviews. An agnostic will have a different worldview. A Muslim would have a different worldview. A Hindu would have a different worldview. And many people say that they don't have a worldview because many people say that they don't have a faith. But actually they do have a faith. Evolutionism is a faith. And evolutionism, evolutionists will debate that with you. But they do have a faith. Darwin is their God. Oxford, Cambridge, Bristol University are the temples and the institutes that they bow before. Their professors are their theologians, are their gurus. And so they bow, they believe something. And so when you find when you engage in an atheist on that, he will agree, yes, I believe something, I have faith in something, and I have faith in evolution. And so the humanist or the secularist will speak from their world. So how should the Christian respond then? How should the Christian respond to any or all of us? The Christian hears the case, as you must, you hear the case, but does not respond like the rest of the world. We don't respond like the rest of the world. The Christian doesn't jump onto every bandwagon. You don't just stand there and say, oh yeah, and you jump onto that one. You say, oh yeah, okay, jump onto that one. No, you, you, you sit back and you don't just raise your fist and shout your chants with the rest of the world. No, the Christian responds from a biblical position, a biblical worldview. We see the world through the lens of the Bible. For, for, for the Christians, the matters and issues of this life are understood by what the Bible says. By this I mean we don't use the world to interpret the Bible, we use the Bible to interpret the world. In other words, what does the Bible say about this issue, that issue, or the other issue? For example, what does it say about the Meghan Markle issue? What does it say about the school uniform issue? What does it say about the government report that came out that says racism does not exist in the, in the, in the United Kingdom? Does the Bible mention any of them? Like, can we go to the Bible to find the answers to any of these very, very specific things? No, we can't. It's not in the Bible. But the Bible teaches and directs us on how to respond to these matters and any matter that comes in. And, we, and the response for the Christian is, like I said, a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. We respond to what the Bible says. So our text tells us in Psalm 119, verse 105, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now this entire, this entire psalm deals with God's word. And in its entirety, it's a wonderful blessing. And uh, preachers of old have, have memorized this entire psalm for, for its importance concerning God's word. In the first 10 verses itself, if you, look, if you keep your bookmark on uh, verse 105 and look at from verse 1 of Psalm 119. There are words that are repeated continuously a number of times, close on to 10 times each word is repeated in the entire psalm. And I won't go through the number of times each word is repeated, but I'll highlight the words from verse 1 to verse 10. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. The word law there is, you'll find it um, you know, repeated many times, the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies. It is the same thing. The law, the testimony, he's talking about the word of God. Who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness, that they walk in his ways. So his ways are also the law. His ways are also the testimonies. And for you have ordained your precepts. Same thing. So precepts are his ways. It's, it's his testimonies. It is his law. That they should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established. Uh, to keep your statutes. Again, statutes is the, is the same thing as precepts, as laws. As testimonies, then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon your commandments. Now that's a word we're very familiar with. It's describing the same thing. I shall give thanks to you with my, uh, sorry, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn of your righteous judgments. And do, uh, I will keep your statutes. Again, you see the word repeated. And do not forsake me utterly. So we find all through, all through the Psalms, all through the psalm is the 
a repetition of these words, uh, bringing to the forefront, highlighting the importance of God's word. And right slap bang almost in the middle there uh, is uh, verse 105. It says, um, God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The overarching, that's the overarching point, the overarching point here of verse 5 is the word is illumination. It illuminates, it brings light. It's illumination to every believer, right? Every believer in Jesus Christ. In what way is it illumination? Well, we see clearly that it is illumination in our path. That word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I take this to mean our daily walk with the Lord. As we traverse this human world, as we go through this fallen world in expectation of the Lord's second coming, in expectation of being with the Lord in, in, in physical death, and uh, in, in expectation of that as we travel as pilgrims through this world towards our celestial city, we find that our road is wrought with difficulties. There is a hill called despondency. There is a road called difficulty. And we face those hills and those roads every day of our life. And we look at the psalm here in verse 105 and we find that these words, lamp and light, are there. So consider these words, lamp and light. Though we do not use a lamp today uh, as they did in the time of the writing of the psalm, I do believe the significance of the, of the use of the word lamp is very much applicable to us today. And we should not in any way turn that word into a flashlight or some sort of halogen bulb, or some sort of other light that we can come up with today. And I'll tell you why. So we should not say that word is a flashlight, or a stadium light, or some massive light. There's a reason why. I say we should not change it. Someone has observed, and I quote, He who carries a lantern on a dark road at night sees only one step ahead. When he takes that step, the lamp moves forward, and another step is made. He finally reaches his destination in safety without once walking in darkness. All the way is lighted, but only a single step at a time. This is the method of God's guidance. End quote. In other words, the lamp, the light of the lamp is enough to light one step. And you take a step. And then it's enough to light another step. And you take another step. And very soon you've walked the path that God is directing you in. One step at a time. As a child of God refuses to worry about tomorrow and trust for him today, he finds that the light of God's word, uh, in, finds by the light of God's word, the grace and the guidance of the Lord our God in every situation of life. Even as a lantern illuminates each new step on a dark road at night, so the lamp of Scripture, Scripture itself, Provides the light on our path. It isn't necessary. I say that to you to say this. It isn't necessary to see beyond what the Lord reveals. Following his leading. There's enough light for each step of the way. And this is in keeping with what I preached two weeks ago. When I said to you. When I asked you if the Lord is your shepherd. This is in keeping with that. I said we position ourselves behind the shepherd. We're not ahead of him. We're not in front of him. Our position is to be behind the shepherd. Therefore we can say the Lord is our shepherd. And if we're, if we're standing behind the shepherd. All we see is him. And nothing else. Oh, my counsel to my family last night. As we were praying in, my, um, in our prayers. Uh, we were encouraging our family, as we do not know the answers to many things last night, we did not at one point know the answers to many things. My family will bear witness, as I said to them, we do not know what the answers are tomorrow or the day after or what the treatment will hold on Wednesday or whether the procedures are going to go forth for the next days, we do not know. But what we do know is that we have the lamp, which is God's word, to light our path right now as we step. Let's take that step. Believing and trusting in the Lord. And we take the next step. And we take the next step. And we take the next step. And that's what we did all through the night. Even with your prayers through the night. That's what we did. So one step at a time. You've heard it's said either through maybe some positive mentality guru guy somewhere. Uh, but this is God's word. 
Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One step at a time. As we journey, where we put our feet determines the path we go down. Have you heard that phrase, you put your foot in it, or you put your foot in your mouth, or something to that effect? It means you've done something wrong, you placed your foot in the wrong place. And so you find that uh, where we put our feet where it determines the path that we take. Put your foot in the wrong place and you go down the wrong path. So our God is so loving and caring for us that He's given us Himself, He's given us His Word, which is Himself, to illuminate our step one step at a time. So as we journey, our path is, path is littered with many things, some of them being the issues that are facing the world today. Our response to these issues is a matter of where we place our feet. Place your foot in the wrong path by what you say or by your opinion leads to your destruction. As you consider the issues of the day, both large and small, controversial or not, Jesus is your shepherd in addressing those issues. If Jesus is your shepherd in coming to church, then Jesus must also be your shepherd in addressing those issues. If Jesus is your shepherd, when you say, the Lord is my shepherd, I trust in you as I go to work today. I trust in you as I do this exam today. I trust in you as I engage in this conversation today. Then you must also trust that he's your shepherd when you're talking to anyone about the issues that are facing, uh, that you are facing or you want to um, comment on or have an opinion. So let's look at some of those issues. Let's look at the Meghan Markle issue. And in the context of the interview given, so many things have been said, and I think one of the most striking things was about the alleged racism. And as you heard all of this and continue, and it, and it continues to dominate our headlines in one way or another, how does your family respond to this? How do you as individual believers respond to this? What are you telling your children about this? It's clearly in conversations everywhere. You cannot hide from it. So what are you telling your children about it? Well, here's what you should do. Well, here's what you should be saying on the matter. Are you ready? Keep your bookmark. Keep your bookmark on Psalm 119 and go be to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. <clears throat> and when you get to Proverbs 18, look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, The first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines it. Can you see that? Is everybody there? Proverbs 18, verse 17. The first to plead his case seem right until another comes and examines it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another version from the King James. He that is first in his own case seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. That's the King James version. The ESV says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. What does this text have to do with the interview? You ask, Pastor. Well, that's a good question. Let me answer you. Well, Proverbs 18.17 tells us how we should be responding. It tells us that we do not respond like the rest of the world and jump into every conversation and vilify the accused. What we should be doing is wait for a response from the other side. And I mean this for any conversation, for any accusation made. The first argument seems right, Proverbs 18 tells us, 1817. So the first one to tell you his case, the first one to tell you what he's experienced, the first one to make the claim or the accusation seems right, Proverbs says, until, until another comes and brings a counter argument or brings a counter position and by doing so questions the first argument. And by doing so, then we can truly say who is saying what and actually what's going on. Why? Because we tend to now hear both sides of the situation. So I guess the first response as believers, the first response from a biblical worldview, is not to make a decision without hearing the other side. But you say, well, she's telling the truth, right? You would say, well, she's telling the truth. Well, I say, really? How do you know that? How do you know she's telling the truth? And I mean this for any situation. I'm using this example because it's popular. But I say this for any situation. You're hearing anybody speak and make a claim. And you say, I believe them. And I say, why, why and how do you believe them? Do you have proof of what they said? No, they can't be telling a lie. Surely they can't be telling a lie. I know them. I know them from, from childhood. I know them from school. I know them. They can't be telling a lie. Mommy, Daddy, this is my friend. They can't be telling a lie. I say, really? 
Are they beyond lying? Is lying not their portion? Are they beyond lying? Every one of us is a candidate to fall in the trap of lying. Every one of us. And so our text helps us to see who is telling the truth. Our text tells us claims are verified or whether they are truth or lies when they come under the scrutiny or the questioning or the cross-examination or the inspection. Our text tells us. We are very often moved to make decisions to respond from our own bias, from our own bias. For example, if we have a, had a problem with racial abuse, we will be, will be biased in our opinions of this interview, leaning towards the claims made because we know personally what that may feel like or feels like, because we, we may have in one way or another experienced that sort of prejudice. So we lean towards the matter because it affects us personally. And as you listen to it, you say, oh yeah, I, I, can, I can identify with that. I say to you, my dear friends, dear church, we must learn and train ourselves with the help of the Lord not to do that and not to take a position, but to wait to hear what the other side has to say. What are you doing when you take that position, when you wait? What are you doing? You're using Psalm 119, verse 105. You're letting the word, which is Proverbs 18, 17. You're letting the word be your light and your path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What are you doing? You're using Proverbs 18, 17 to be the word that lights your path. So concerning this, the word says to me, I should not believe this side nor believe this side. I need to hear both sides of the argument. This should be our position on every matter where accusations are brought or claims are made. One of the preachers of old tells a story concerning this point. He says an industrious man by trade, a mason, was engaged to build a piece of wall, uh, a certain wall, um, and he came at the appointed time and he laid the foundation according to the specifications and he proceeded with building the wall. So, uh, layer upon layer, course upon course, according to the approved method that he had done over many years as a mason, he was, he was, this was his craft, he was well trained in it, and he continued to build the wall, uh, layer upon layer, course upon course. And when the work was, was advancing, the wall was getting higher, uh, several feet above the ground, a younger man came, a younger man with a more steadier hand and a more brighter eye, uh, the, the, the commentator says, he came to assist the older man. So the young man cast his eye on the work and he looked at the wall as, as he laid down his tools and, and he said, uh, there's, there's a defect in the wall. Instantly he called out to, this, to the old man and he said, hey, listen, there's a, there's a defect. Have you used a, a plumb? In those days it was called a plumb, but we call it a level these days. So you use, have you used a level? So the old man said, no, it must be plumb, it must be level. And he grasped his level, his rule, they called it the rule at that time, he grasped his level, and he laid it along the wall. And he saw, yes, it was level. So he said, look, it's level. So the rule, or the level, was examined, and it was discovered that uh, in the way they used the level, the way they used it at that time, they put a string and use it. He discovered that he put the string in the wrong place, on, on the rule, on the level. And therefore, what he saw was level, was actually not level, because he put the string in the wrong place. Therefore, the entire wall had to be taken down, and the man lost the entire day's wages. What's the point of the story? Well, the old man thought he was right and on the right path until another man came to examine his work. And by doing so, it was found that the old man was indeed wrong. I say, hold your tongue, keep your position until you've heard both sides of the issue. I do not believe this is a matter in which every one of us can, uh, I, I, I do believe this is a matter in which every one of us here today can, could do well in. And I say that in the sense of holding our tongue and making sure that we apply Proverbs 18.17, the first to plead this case seem right until another comes and examines it. So let us not be quick to come to a decision, to render a verdict or to arrive at a, a judgment without hearing the other side also. 
When your university friends or your family friends ask you what you make of the issue, have you seen the interview, what do you think, so forth and so on. And they ask you, have you made up your mind? Have you? So you ask them, have you heard the other side? See, that's your Christian worldview. Is to exercise your Christian worldview, have you, have you heard the other side? And as you do that, you go on to minister to them, you go on to preach the gospel to them, you go on to bring enlightenment to them about what they need to do. That is your Christian witness. Not to be quick to respond, not to be quick to make a decision or to bring a judgment until you've heard the other side and you tell them that they should do the same, for that's what you've done. But you're sitting there thinking, hold on, should I do this for everything she said? Well, there are some points on this that's very easy to comment without going to Proverbs 18, 17. When Harry and Meghan took their problems to the public on a show that is rated the most watched in the world, they did not stop to consider what damage this would do their, to their family. I speak of this damage in the context of how it will affect their parents, their grandparents, especially if you, as we consider the fifth commandment. Honor your mother and your father. So that's where you come in, with your Christian worldview. As you consider this, as, as people bring this to your attention, to ask what you think about it. This is what you say. What we saw in the public, what we saw in the interview was two children, Meghan and Harry, talking very badly about their parents. Taking a private matter and making it public, talking very badly so that the entire world is now speculating about who said what and when they said it. They spoke very badly about their parents. My daddy didn't give me enough money for security. I asked him for money and he didn't give me enough money. And so bringing the business of the family into the public space, talking very badly about their parents. And I say to you, even if what they said was true, even if what they said was true, this was not the way to go about it. And I pray to your friends, children that are listening, that you would teach your children that if you have a problem with your parents, that you will not broadcast a single bad word about your mother or your father to anyone. But you might say, Megan and Harry aren't your believers, right? So therefore, this law doesn't apply to them. Only your mother and your father, they aren't really believers. I say to you, the law does apply to them. Why? Because it is a moral law. Remember what I said to you quite a few months ago when we, when we spoke about this? Not, not about this issue, but about the law. We said this is a moral law. In other words, how does it apply to Meghan and Harry? Because Meghan and Harry, if you said to them, thou shalt not commit murder, would you agree with them? They say yes. So the law applies to them. They believe the law. It's the moral law. See, but you can't take one part of the moral law and leave the rest of the law. You have to obey the entire moral law. So the moral law says, thou shalt not murder, but it also says, honor your mother and your father. So the law does apply to them. So when I watched the interview, I watched it with a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. I saw that Meghan and Harry are symbols and representatives of children and families across this globe who do not honor their mother and their father. Through that interview, Meghan and Harry have become Icons, poster children for the dishonor of your mother and father campaign. That's what I saw. Let me just shift gears a little bit and hit home a little bit with this. If your home has been influenced by this interview, then I urge you by the grace of God to think again of the influence this has brought into your family and how it affects the rest of your path. The world's standards and values of gradually changed the Christian family and leading to the destruction of the Christian family. The words of the Old Testament, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, remains mostly as a plaque on the entrance of somebody's home rather than a reality in the family members. Christian families are being shaped by the likes of Hollywood as they are being shaped by Meghan and Markle. They're merely celebrity types. So families are, are, are being shaped by these by these Hollywood celebrities and listening to what Hollywood celebrities are saying about how to raise their children. Some pop star or some pop icon says, well, this is how I raise my child. And so Christians are also tending to follow their pattern and raise their children in a similar way. Why? Because their celebrity icon has said so. Much of modern advertising tells us that acting young is better than being mature. In virtually every form of media and in every avenue, our culture encourages us to question authority rather than submit to it. In any, in, any, in any direction a child turns today, in almost every direction, he will find somebody ready to tell him, 
Just do what seems right. In the words of Sir Nike, just do it. Just do what seems right. I remember preaching in Bristol and I saw these young ladies and you'll see them out again because it's an annual charity that, come, charity that comes to Bristol. These young people wear this t-shirt this that says, just do it. Right, just do it. So I stopped it. They were they're out of the bucket and I stopped preaching and I said, what should I just do? I asked the young girl, I said, what should I just do? She says, what do you mean? I said, well, you see, well, I like to abuse young children. Should I just do that? Because you see, what you're saying is not specific about anything. You're just saying, just do it. If I have a particular bend on life, should I just do that? If I want to abuse somebody, should I just do that? And she stood there shocked. She said, nobody's ever asked me that question. Just do it. Just do what seems right. The world is telling our young people. But this is not the way it should be, right? This is not the way it should be. God has designed it so that the parents' duty is to discipline and raise their children in the ways of the Lord. And it is the duty of the children to obey and honor their parents. However, rejecting parental authority uh, brings devastation upon the generation. It puts them on the path of failure, on the path of heartache, and ultimately God's judgment. What we see in the public square is not a result of what happens in the public square. What we see in the public square, in the anarchy of the children that we see there every week, is because of what's happening in their homes. Rebels are being raised, not in schools, rebels are being raised in the home. Disobedience is not in schools, disobedience is in the homes. Disobedience is not in the workplace, but in the homes. Disobedience in the public square starts with disobedience in the home. In the most simplest language, honor your mother and father. This is the first commandment of the promise, Ephesians 6. But many, many Christian parents are not turning to God's word, but to all other means. Christian seminars, books, articles on family continue to multiply. There are volumes of ideas and principles proposed for strengthening the family. Child psychology books continue to fill the bookshelves with ideas of how to raise your children with the new fandangle technology and ideas. Maybe you have some of those books, maybe you've read them, I have no idea. There are blogs and chat rooms that you can go to where people will extend their idea to you about how to raise your child. Beloved, the word, the word of the Lord is clear to us. God's word gives us the basis for the right parent-child relationship in just four verses. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, honor your father and your mother, which is... The first commandment with the promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth and your fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Book of Ephesians. So that's this scripture together with other scriptures provide a supporting uh, structure for us on how to raise our children. So when we study that and when we apply it, it should be the strengthening of the family rather than a destruction of the family. This call for children to be obedient and honor their parents and parents not to provoke their children runs far deep. And I preached on it in our Biblical Wisdom for the Family series. It's, it's, it's founded on, on the Old Testament text in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 to 9. When he says, you shall teach them diligently to your children and, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them. As a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorsteps of your house and your gates. What is the they and the them that Moses is talking about? Let me help you. Let me paraphrase it. You shall teach truth to your children diligently. And they shall talk of truth when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind truth as a sign on your hand. And truth shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write truth on your doorsteps of your house and your gates. What is the truth? The truth is God's word. So what this tells us then is that every Christian home, there is, has to be a visible, audible commitment to the word of God. In every Christian home. This is, this is God's plan. This was God's plan from the very beginning. To pass on truth. Parents passing on the truth to their children so that they grow in the faith and they pass on the truth to their children and this is the passing on the truth. This is a multi-generational plan of God. There is evidence concerning this Meghan Markle 
issue an interview that we can act on even immediately without saying another word. We can judge character by the record of the character. Is the person who's made the argument consistent or inconsistent in their character? So you sit back and you look and say, hold on, here's a person who says something. How, what's the track record of this person? Has this person been consistent or inconsistent in their views? Well, you, 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 can, you can clearly make a case here for Meghan Markle. Uh, are there signs of hypocrisy? Or anyone else that you want to, that, that brings a claim or an argument? Are there signs of hypocrisy? Are there signs of double standards? Well, when I watch the interview, we say clearly, yes, there's a double standard. Clearly, yes, there's a hypocrisy. But you may say, how? Well, I say to you, consider that Meghan Markle is a feminist. A staunch supporter of two worldviews. What are the two worldviews? One, th these two worldviews dominate the world today in a major way. One, transgenderism and the other, abortion. Megan believes, Megan believes that the baby that she's now carrying is not a baby but merely a clump of cells. She's been recorded saying that she's been supporting many people who want to have abortions because she says this is not a baby, it is a clump of cells. Rewind to the interview and she walks onto the stage and Oprah extends her arms and looks at her pregnant and says, wow. And Megan says, I'm expecting a clump of cells. Right? She tells Oprah it's a clump of cells, right? What does she tell Oprah? It's a baby. It's a baby. Now she's gone from a clump of cells to a baby. She's changed her view. This is hypocritical of her because according to her view, in her support of abortion, that we can murder a baby legally because it is not a baby, it has no life, it's not human, because it's merely a clump of cells. How do we respond? Well, we respond inside with Psalm 127. It lights our path. It's the word that lights our path. Telling us that children are a gift from God. Biological science confirms the Bible, that life begins at conception, and that taking the human life either in the womb or outside the womb is murder. The sixth commandment lights our path. Thou shalt not murder. Secondly, we can, we can judge her character quite easily. Yeah, she believes that a child must decide whether they are male or female. And nobody, nobody, she says, has the right to decide whether the person's, the person's gender, except the person themselves. In other words, the baby must be born. When the baby is born, the doctor has no right to say, hey, Mrs. So-and-so, you have a girl or a boy. Because the baby must decide whether it's a girl or a boy at some time in his life. So that's Megan's position. Well, we see the hypocrisy here because in the interview, her pregnancy was noted and she said she's having a girl, right? <clears throat> Proverbs 23, 23 says, By truth, by truth, not B-Y, but B-U-Y, by truth, and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understand. By truth, do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. Enough about Megan. Enough about Harry. We haven't mentioned him much, but enough about him. Let's move on to another issue. How do Christian families, especially those with children, respond to the news a few weeks ago about the school that, that erupted into a protest about school uniform? The Telegraph reported pupils at a London secondary school have walked out of class in protest of a racist uniform policy that bans hairstyles and block the view of others, and students being asked not to wear hijabs that are too colorful, unquote, or end quote. The national flag was torn down as in that protest by these children. The national flag outside the school uh, was torn down. So basically the issue had to do with afros and hijabs. It had to do with afros and hijabs. How should a Christian respond to this? How do you as a parent help your child understand what's going on and how to respond to it? Well, we take a biblical worldview. We will let the word of God inform our thoughts and dictate our actions and our speech. We let the word of God be our lamp and our light. The first thing we see as we do that is that the principal is imposing some sort of discipline in the school. Uniforms are meant to convey the idea that, no, that one is not better than the other. That's the purpose of uniform. It's to create an equality. If one, one child comes from a rich home and another comes from a poor home, when they come to school wearing the same uniform, you find no difference in them. That's the purpose of uniforms. To create a standard of equality so that, so that schooling can go on without one looking down upon the other. 
So this step by the principal was to maintain a uniform standard, and he did so by implementing discipline, which according to him was fair, fair measures, because it still allowed the diversity of the students. What he was trying to do was just cut it, or curtail it, or curb it in a little way. However, this boils down to the fact that these children refuse to accept the discipline now imposed upon them. Proverbs 10.17, if you're taking down notes, Proverbs 10.17, whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. Discipline is good for us. Children need discipline. We all need discipline. Further, tearing down the national flag was an act of rebellion against the nation, against authority. It was an act of rebellion from children who really, really at the end of the day, are really just spoiled. Why do I say that? Well, consider that they have a good school with vast amount of resources and they sit down for a lunch meal served in a nice cafeteria. They get to walk around grounds and talk with their friends in a safe environment. Let's transform you to the other part of the world and there are children on the other end of the world who are not so fortunate, not so privileged. These children at the other end of the world do not get dropped off in a nice car just outside the school gate, but have to walk a mile to school or even more. But before walking those miles to school, have to get up in the, early in the morning, go to the river or to the well, fetch the water, milk the cow, get the goats out to graze and clean the house, then walk a mile to school. So they should be giving thanks, right? They should be giving thanks for what they have. So the Bible informs me here from 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in all things give thanks. Have a grateful heart. Be thankful for what you have. So these should, these should in fact be very thankful children rather than unthankful and grateful children. So allowing these issues to enter the home with our parents' full awareness or it will lead to the fostering and the expansion of rebellion in your own home where children will end up being unthankful, ungrateful for what they have even if it is just a little bit. But what about the hot issue of racism? This issue that doesn't seem to go away. The recent government report led by, led this headlines in the Telegraph, and I quote, UK not deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities, end quote. Now many people, including the mother of the murdered black teenager, Stephen Lawrence, was outraged at this report saying that it does not truly show the racism that actually exists. How do Christians respond? How do Christians respond to this? Well, seeing that the majority of our church come from what is called ethnic minorities, how do we respond to this? Well, the Bible has the answer for us, and I say very clearly, as we did last year, BLM is not our answer. The Bible is our answer. We cannot align with BLM, although we may think that they're just like us, or they know what we're going through, or they are, are familiar with our oppression, our prejudice that we face. Therefore, let's support them. We cannot do that because we are Christians. And as Christians, we take a biblical worldview. We choose what is right. We spent a vast amount of time last year speaking about this, especially when it came to the forefront. And we brought our biblical worldview, looking at the social justice revolution. And I'm not going to spend much time on that, but I... We'll bring a few points this morning. I think as for me and my wife, and I think one other person in this congregation, we have come from countries that had a very strict policy of racial segregation. I come from South Africa. Augie comes from once Soviet-occupied Bulgaria. So if there's anybody else that comes from similar countries, please let me know. But as far as I know, it is my wife and I, and Augie that comes from a country where that type of segregation was the law. Strict policies of segregating people, racism, dominated every aspect of life. I won't give you, I won't bore you with the details of how we grew up in a legally segregated country. In South Africa, segregation was legal. In other words, it was the law that I couldn't sit down with the white person. It was a law that we couldn't go to a white school. It was a law that we couldn't sit in a restaurant with a white person. It was a law that we couldn't go to the same beach with the white person. What is the same, right? But we couldn't go to the same beach. We had to go to the beach that was shark infested, and the whites got to go to the beach that was at shark nets. 
we had to take two buses to get into town and the bus, the bus would not leave us in town, would leave us outside of town and we had to walk into town past all the gangsters and so forth and so on to get into town. But whites would be bused into town. This was legal segregation. In order for us to get to university, we couldn't just get A's, we had to get double A's and triple A's. That's the only way to beat the system to get into university because uh, non-whites would get to the bottom of the pile. See, if you were to talk about segregation, we grew up in a legally segregated country. How then, me and my wife, or my wife and I growing up in a legally segregated country, how do we make sense of oppression? Surely we should be angry. Surely we should be raising our fists with BLM and saying, yes, we agree with you, we've been through that. Well, let me just give you a little bit more history and help you and share with you. When I look at the apartheid of South Africa's history, what I find is actually the British, the British were the main culprits in promoting this racial segregation. We thought it was the Africana, but it wasn't Africana, it was the British. The British were very good at that, in creating this racial segregation. When Mahatma Gandhi left India to go set up his legal practice in South Africa, it was the British who told him that he, he just bought a ticket and sat in the first class cabin. <laughs> he, he said, this is my ticket, and I went, he went to sit in the first class cabin. And the British officer came and said to him, no, you can't sit in the first class cabin, because that's reserved for the whites. And so, so began Mahatma Gandhi's journey. His journey, didn't, his journey of rebellion against what was happening in India and the segregation didn't begin in India, it began in South Africa. And so the British locked him up. And they said, the only way we'll let you out of prison is if you go back to India and never return. And he agreed to that after uh, a few months, never to return to South Africa. And so he went on to India and became an activist then. So the, very, the British were very good at this. They were very good. For example, in India, when the British were in India, they did the same thing. The caste system, would, in, in which, for example, uh, uh, which separates people. If you're born into a certain group of people, if you're born by a certain name or a certain location, you'd fall under a certain caste and therefore you'd be uh, disqualified from doing what others who are of a higher caste would be able to do. For example, go to schools, find work and so forth and so on. So the lowest caste would do the work of cleaning the sewers and whatever and the highest caste would get the higher jobs. And I'm just making that very brief for you to understand. When the British arrived in India, the caste system was almost not present at all. It was, it was on the way out. It was the British that brought the caste system back for the purpose of their own gain. They said, if we separate the people, we can dominate the people. So that's what they did. The British separated the people to dominate them so that they could get the wealth back to the United Kingdom, the wealth back to the United Kingdom. And what did they do? Well, they said, well, listen, uh, you guys have made this fine linen, this muslin, just called muslin. You know, muslin is a very fine cloth. It was sold. India was selling this fine linen to Rome. So the Roman ladies with their great dresses would wear this fine, they would call it lighter than air. We want this cloth from India. And so India was selling it to Rome and making a lot of money from it. And the British said, ah, we could do that. And so they took the, the, they took the loom industry from, from, from India and brought it to the West Midlands and other places in the UK and set up these uh, textile mills. And what did the British do? They said, well, you Indians cannot make this anymore. And here's what we're going to do. We're not just going to break your looms, we're going to break your thumbs. And so they broke the thumbs of everybody who were uh, operating these looms so that they could not make this fine cloth anymore. So the wealth increased in the United Kingdom and the wealth decreased in India. Now, as you, why did I tell you that story? Because it is history. And when you learn history, you realize, hey, those people are wrong in what they did. Therefore, I want reparation. Therefore, I want to be paid back. Therefore, they have done great injustice to my people. I want money back. I want them to pay. How do I as a Christian respond? Do I join every group that raises his fists? Do I join every group that asks for reparations? Do I join every group that wants to pull down statues and tear down flags? The answer is no. The Christian view is no. The biblical worldview is no. Why? Because Philippians 2.21 says, let's take it down, for everyone who looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. For everyone who looks out for their own interests. The British were looking out for their own interests. That's what they were doing. They were looking out for their own interests. I'm not saying it's right, it was wrong. But the point is that it's a problem of sin looking out for your own interests. It's a problem of sin. 
where one man or one nation has exploited another nation for their own gain, their own interest. That is an act of sin. Will that sin stop? The British did it hundreds of years ago. Will it stop? The answer is no, it will not stop. Why? Because it is sin. Is it happening today? Yes, it is happening today. Even in some of the nations of Africa, the, the, the governments are exploiting their own people for their own gain. Tribes and tongues are exploiting their own people for their own gain. So the text is true. Everyone looks out for their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. So the problem, my dear friends, is a matter of sin. And man will look after his own interests no matter what it costs others, even their own lives. They do not care as long as they gain financially. So the British have done it in the past. Nations have done it before the British. And nations are doing it presently. This is not a political issue. This is not a social issue. This is a sin issue. It's a sin of the heart. Man covets his neighbor's goods. The British said, we love what you have. We want that. We want it for us. The Bible is clear. Do not covet thy neighbor's goods. Do not go yearning and longing for what he has. So it's a matter of sin, right? It will not stop. This sin, will, will it stop, Pastor? The answer is no. Will it, stop? will it stop? No. It will only stop when every man confesses his sin and submits to Jesus Christ. When he becomes the redeemer of the Lord, then he thinks differently. Then he acts differently. Then he doesn't think, oh, it's only about me. Not my best interest, but the best interest of others. And that is the transforming work of the gospel. Saul was a murderer. A man bent on arresting and killing a certain group of people. The people of the way, the Christians they were called. By our definition today, Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He was an oppressor of a minority group. But the Lord saved him. And his worldview changes. Beloved, the answer, the answer is in the gospel. The answer is in the gospel. What is our part in this matter? What is our part in every issue? The gospel. The preaching of the gospel. That is our response. Consider also that the BLM or Black Lives Matter is a, is a major influence of feminism and the, the removal of the patriarchy. Young girls and boys are being influenced daily in school, social media and other platforms on the, the benefits of tearing down the patriarchy. How does a Christian respond to this? Well, if you, if you align yourself with BLM and you, hey, you want to, you know, we're with you. Well, let me tell you, you're agreeing with them in the sense that they want to tear down your father's authority in the home. The patriarchy. They want to tear it down. We don't want a patriarchy. So how do young Christian girls, how do, young, how do Christian women respond to this? Well, the response should be a biblical worldview, right? We cannot agree with BLM on this matter. Because Christians take our instruction from the word of God, from the Bible. And the Bible is clear. Actually, God invented the patriarchy. God created the patriarchy. Genesis chapter 1, you don't have to go very far. Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, all the way through. God created the patriarchy. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. God is informing our decisions. The word, the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. What does the word tell us? Genesis 2 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man that he should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Man was created first, Paul tells us. Then God, God created woman for the man, that she will be helper fit for him. You can do your very best to try and change that text, but you can't do it. This is the created order. This is the divine order. This is what God saw as very good at the end of that text. He says, this is very good. Mr. Adam has now Mrs. Adam. This is very good. God describes it as very good. But sin entered the world through Adam's disobedience and the woman's weakness. And from that time onwards, there's been a war in every family for the headship of the family. This war is clearly man manifested in the feminist movement of our day who are not focused on what's best for women, but are focused on the tearing down of man and the patriarchy. So the Bible informs my decision and position on the patriarchy. But well, what about racism? I'll conclude with this. On the matter of racism, how do you respond as a Christian? Well, let me help you by saying that you need to know, 
You need to be clear. You need to understand that no matter what you do, no matter how much you shout about it, that is racism. No matter how much you report it, no matter how many times you report it, no matter how many petitions you sign, you will never rid the world of racism. Never. Why do I say that? I say that because I'm speaking from a biblical worldview. I'm looking at the world through the lens of the Bible. And by looking at the world through the lens of the Bible, I'm telling you that you can never rid the world of racism. From a biblical worldview, I can see that racism is not a skin issue, but it is a heart issue. By that I mean racism is not about the color of the skin, racism is about the condition of the heart. By this I mean that racism is not about the color of your skin, like I said, but the condition of the heart. One man's hatred and oppression of another is not because he sees the different color of the skin of the person. What? The problem is not the person's color, the problem is the man's heart. This man, the man who is oppressing the next man. It's his heart. His, his heart is evil, his heart is bent towards evil, his, his heart is bent towards oppressing other men. Men do evil things because their hearts are wicked. Romans 3 tells us there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes, Paul says. He's describing the state of a sinner. Now, if you, if you consider that and you make racism illegal, let's say you support the campaign to make racism illegal. I say to you, racism will still exist. How will it still exist? It exists like every other thing exists, it goes underground. When the law says you can't do that, what happens? People will still practice it, but underground. So a new law will not rid the world of racism. A new law in the United Kingdom will not rid the world or rid this country of racism. So what's the answer then, Pastor? Well, the answer is clear. What rids this world of racism is not a new law but a new heart. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus came. It's not to rid the world of a, uh, not to give the world a new law, uh, but a new heart. And that's the only way that racists uh, will, will change is when they, they get a new heart. That's what happened with Paul. Saul, sorry, who became Paul. His prejudice, his racism in a way, against these people who are called the way, changed when he became born again. So when you're born again, you don't get a new law, you get a new heart. And God is in the business of changing the vilest racists, the vilest sinners. After all, you know, God has called rapists and murderers and all sorts to be born again. The vilest creatures can be saved. Even as we sing in our church and as the hymn tells us, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. If you're a victim of racial abuse, know the answer is the gospel. Racism does not magically disappear when you impose a fine or because somebody has been reported that they're racist and they lost their job. Racism doesn't disappear if they're fired. They continue to be racist. They just they become racist somewhere else. So the only way racism disappears is like when all, in the same way all sin disappears, when it is dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ. The answer is the gospel. Jesus came to save sinners from every tribe and tongue and nation and people group. I say it again because I make a point as I close. Jesus came to save people from every tribe and tongue and nation and people group. I did not say Jesus came to save people who are black or white. Why? I choose my words carefully because out of my, out of my uh, knowledge of God's word, I'm speaking. God's word is lighting my path. Therefore, I choose carefully in what I say. I'm exercising the very sermon that I'm preaching to you today. Jesus came to save not black or white, because in the Bible, there is no black and white. The Bible says there aren't many races. The Bible says there is only one race. What is that race? 
the human race. We're all descendants of Adam. We all have the same father and the same mother. The only difference between one and another is this thing called melanin. One group has more, the other has less. You can ask God why that's the case. I have no idea. One has more, the other has less. I'd like to think that God loves me more, He gave me more. <laughs> so, the human race, you see, that's your worldview. So, when you speak of racism, your worldview dictates how you respond. Or oh, this race and that race, you say, what, what, where did you get that from? Especially if you believe in one race, the human race. So the answer is the gospel, and concerning the gospel, we are not called, I'll close with this. Let's say I was closing, we'll close with this. Concerning the gospel, we're not called to protest, we're called to preach. We're not called to protest, we're called to preach. And there's a, there's a clear difference between the two. Our response to racism is not to protest, but to preach the gospel. That's our contribution. That's what we must do. Standing at a, at, a, at a protest march is not going to bring a solution to the problem. Preaching the gospel will bring a solution to the problem. When man's heart changes, he sees mankind differently. Ten commandments bear upon his heart. The ten commandments are divided into two parts. A, a, a vertical relationship and a horizontal relationship. The first part is the vertical relationship. All about God, honor God, glorify God. And then the second part is about how to love your neighbor, honor your mother and your father. So we have a horizontal, we have a vertical relationship and a horizontal relationship. Out of our vertical relationship comes our horizontal relationship. So a man is right with God, he's right with man. So the answer is the gospel. Our response to racism is not to protest, but to preach. Why? Because you know from the Bible that the problem is not what's the problem is not what's on the surface, but what lies beneath what's in the heart. Let's get to our conclusion. Look at me in Psalm 119. Look at what the psalmist says. Listen to how he speaks about the word that's impacted his life. Remember? From Psalm 119, verse 1, we just took 10 verses and we spoke of the the high value of God's word in the psalmist's life. All the way through the psalm, he acknowledges God's word. You get to verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are mine. Imagine that. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies? Isn't that interesting? Already the word of God is working to better you, right? Because it's making you wiser than your enemies. Listen to what it does further. Verse 99. I have more insight than all my teachers. He's not saying he's better than his teachers. And there are many, I tell you young people right now, if you have God's word in your heart, and if God's word is branded upon your heart, and you speak with a Christian worldview, you will exercise more wisdom than people who are maybe twice your age of the world. Because God's word has dripped your heart. Listen to what the psalmist says. I have more insight into something than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. You see why? Because it is God's word. Verse 100, I understand more than the aged because I have observed your precepts. Uh -huh. I understand more about what's happening than people who are older than me because, not because I'm better than them. <laughs> you know, we say this and you should learn this. Brother Adrian taught me this when we were preaching. He would say, I'm, I'm not better than you, I'm just better off than you. And there's a big difference. The psalmist is saying, I'm not better than you, I'm just better off. Why am I better off? Because I have God's Word. God's Word gives me the insight. I see things differently than you do. Look at Psalm 101. I oh, sorry, verse 101. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your Word. The, the, the Word is helping in that sense. I have not turned aside from your ordinances for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. You are sweeter than honey to the mouth. Your precepts, uh, from your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. So in other words, your precepts help you to, the precepts of God help you to discover what's true and false. And therefore, when it helps you to discover what's true and false, you hate that which is false. Isn't that marvelous? Conclusion.
This preacher likes to, this pastor here likes to draw illustrations from the 1800s. Let me introduce you to something called a slide rule. Slide rule was a, uh, it's like a ruler, it has, has a slide on it, a number of markings on it, and people would do calculations with the, with the slide rule, by sliding the slider on the rule. So, the slide rule looks very much like a, 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 a ruler, uh, and if you use it today, it seems very much like an ancient relic. But many, many years ago, people in all kinds of trades, in various kinds of vocations, found a slide rule to be indispensable. This ingenious instrument was used to make complex mathematical calculations. Very quickly, they do it that as well. A man recalls the first day of his engineering school in 1953. A professor advised the, the, the entering freshman to buy the best slide rule he could afford. The professor told him, you will be dependent on this for the rest of your professional life. Well, the man dutifully bought the slide rule. And after he graduated, he went on, went on to MIT. And he never used the slide rule ever again. Why? Because the calculator had just been invented. So he never used the slide rule ever again. Things that today we consider indispensable may quickly become obsolete tomorrow. Tomorrow, they may be discarded as relics that, that cannot provide the help we need. As you consider that, know this, at least one thing from the ancient past always will be needed and never become obsolete. One thing will be needed and never become obsolete. This book will remain the one sure means for getting the right answers. No matter how complicated the situation, no matter how complicated the questions, no matter where the questions come from, or what the purpose of the question is, this book continues to give us the right answer. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen.